How long have you had these droids? About three or four seasons. They're up for sale if we want them. Let me see your identification. You don't need to see his identification. We don't need to see his identification. These aren't the droids you're looking for. These aren't the droids we're looking for. He can go about his business. You can go about your business. Move along. Move along. Move along. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. This is Cheap Seat Reviews. <laughs> I said, you said the guy with the water bottle made me think of Gallagher. Sure. Yeah, you say that, I say racism. Named Jedi Master Bates. Hello, and thank you for listening to Cheap Seat Reviews, the podcast that explores the Hollywood film industry for the greater good. I was going to try to do an R2-D2 voice, and it came out uh, really, really poorly. Um, For the greater good. (laughs) That was... That was better though. Beep boop bop yeah. beep boop bop. <laughs> beep beep beep. I tried to whistle and it just didn't didn't come through for some strange reason. Okay. It sounded like you uh, got choked on a milkshake. Is kind of what it. <laughs> yeah. It'd be nice. I wish I could. Oh yeah, milkshake sounds great. <laughs> I'd be this, delicious about this time of night. This is episode three hundred and seventy, and tonight and it's a very special episode. It is a very special episode. We are doing a movie that, frankly, I never thought we would ever review on this podcast. But here it is. Tonight we're talking about Star Wars, A New Hope. Now, I know what you're thinking. Like, wait a minute. Star Wars, A New Hope. That's that's holy ground. That's, you know, that's like the, the pinnacle <laughs> of nerddom. I mean, that's, you know, you, you can't be mean to this or nerd culture right? everywhere will hate you. And Absolutely. And I... Uh, that was one of the reasons why I never wanted to do this. But you're saying to yourself, then, well, why, Sean? Why are you doing this? I said, <laughs> well, it's because we have some of the best listeners. And one of the listeners said, you need to do the original trilogy because you've reviewed the sequel trilogy and now the prequel trilogy. And I need all nine of them, I guess 11, I need them all done. We said, okay, we'll do it because you're an awesome listener. And we will do these things for you. So here we well, are. Well, and, and it is interesting to take a movie like this and, and try to look at it through a critical lens, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, I've always watched this with a fandom lens and, and a, a, you know, the eyes of an eight year old watching this. And it was, a, we'll talk about it, but it was interesting watching it as a, with a critical eye. It's a little different. It is different. So I am Sean Allred, and joining me tonight is Andrew McClunky Jimison. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I should have asked before I I did that middle name. I should have asked. We all watched the Disney Plus version of this movie, right? Yes. Yeah. It's what was available. Yeah, it's what was available. Okay. Just wanted to make sure, because otherwise this won't make sense. Sense? This won't make Lance. sense. Wow. You can't keep a good robot down. <laughs> <laughs> That was uh, a really good impression there, Sam. Yeah, it was, it was great. <laughs> and also joining us tonight is Sam McClunky Vector. All right. Hey, uh, Sean, just so you know, I've already sold you to the Jawas. They're on their way. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. That's actually not the worst way to go <laughs> in this movie franchise. <laughs> um, that is true. Yeah. yeah there's, well, yeah, I was going to say something about uh, sending it into a Sarlacc pit, but we didn't quite get there in this one. We haven't been there yet. Um, I can't. I can't jump ahead um, until we get there. Yeah, so we'll see. All right, so let's pull up a comfy chair and dive into this movie, Star Wars: A New Hope, 1977's Star Wars: A New Hope. Like Sam says, uh, we're we're kind of having to do this with a critical a critical eye, the cheap seat reviews glasses, as it were, something we haven't put on in a long time. Oh wow! And, uh, yeah, I guess I, I should say it's been so long. I have now. I have prescription to see uh, CSR glasses. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Uh, I forgot to mention. There's no guest today. It's just the three of us, which is perfectly, Feels weird. perfectly fine. A little weird, but you know, it's yeah. it's okay. It's just it's just us. Just it's just us tonight, and I think that's okay. And kind of, I wanted it to be that way because I felt like this movie was such 
a revered piece of art that I didn't want to share it with anyone else, just to be honest. <laughs> um, that sounds super selfish and kind of douchey of me, and I don't really care. Um, so oh. I, I am excited to talk to you about it, and frankly, also a little nervous. But 1977, Star Wars, A New Hope. Andrew, please tell anyone that can't possibly know what this movie is, what is this movie? Okay. Luke Skywalker, who is uh, a Star Wars character, by the way, is he? Okay. joins forces with a Jedi Knight who's a little bit cocky. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, I read that wrong. Luke... <laughs> <laughs> Take two. Are you, are you good? Fix it in post. We'll fix it in post. No, no. Leave it. It's fun. Okay. Luke Skywalker joins forces with a Jedi Knight, comma, a cocky pilot, a Wookiee, <laughs> and two droids to save the galaxy from the Empire's world-destroying battle station while also attempting to rescue Princess Leia from the mysterious Darth Vader. Is it Leia or Leia? Either or, or Or Leia. Or Leia, I think it's pronounced it every different way. Yeah. In this movie. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a so there it is. It's a bad I don't know sentence, if anybody but it's a good... even cared what I was reading there, but no, I was I was <laughs> enjoying it. Was... I've never heard of this movie. This is it's gonna be interesting. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> so full disclosure, I just I want you guys to legitimately guess how many times do you think you've seen this movie. Oh gosh, uh, I I mean at least fifteen probably. Yeah, I would say mid teens up into maybe closer to twenty. Okay, that's good. Yeah, um, yeah. I was an only child, and I had movies at my disposal, and so I was I was actually kind of having this this conversation today at work where I realized one of the reasons why I think I love Star Wars and Star Trek so much is simply because it was what was available at the house to watch. And it wasn't like I had Netflix to just, you know, find new things. It's just what we owned. So I would bet that I probably, I would probably be in the 30s to 40s range having seen this movie. Wow. Oh my God. Okay. And same thing with, honestly, the, the Star Trek, <laughs> kind of the Star Trek. What'd you say? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Um, and probably about that number for the for Wrath of Khan and and some of the other Star Trek movies. I just they were they were comfort. They were my not babysitters, but it was there was a lot of days where I was by myself because um, my parents sometimes would work during the summer, um, and so I would. They were both teachers, so they had the summers off. But there were there were weeks where I would wake up and they'd fix me breakfast and they'd go to work. I'd stay at the home at the house by myself. And so I'd put on a movie and play Legos or color or draw or whatever. And I would just have the movie on. So I don't know if I've sat down and watched this thing 40 times, but it, it's probably pretty close to that. So, so, huh. with, so with that being said, though, and I don't want this episode to be me just shitting on the George Lucas version that's on Disney+, Plus, but I'm going to for a minute here. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. Well, I'm right there with you. You know, as an '80s kid, you grow up with a version, and you grow up with with your own imagination and your own way of viewing it. And I think it's a travesty to go back and change uh, some of the things he did. But the the bigger tragedy is not to let us get a version of what we want, yeah. um, and yeah. to refuse the fact that the version we grew up with was not his vision. That's my, that's my beef with it. I, well, I, he could change all he wants, but I want to see what I, what I saw in the eighties. You know, I, I've often wondered if, has there been, and maybe I know this and just can't think of it right now, but has there been another director who has taken a movie that they've made and said, you know what? Uh, second thought, I didn't like how I did this. I'm going to redo it. Now, Spielberg. other than, other than Zack Snyder. And, Spielberg did ET. Whole... He took he, the guns out of ET. Yeah. He redid that. Yep. 
Yeah, he okay. went back. He and gave them all walkie-talkies or something. All of the cops have walkie-talkies because he thought it was too threatening. It was when he had kids and he and George Lucas were going back and doing this stuff. Um, yeah. But do uh, you think about today, though? You know, if James Cameron were to look at Titanic and go, eh, mm, I think maybe I want a bigger iceberg. <laughs> and I want the, I want there to be less light when the ship is sinking. Yeah, you know, something like wh- little things like that. Like the things that George Lucas changed from the original theatrical cut, which I don't even know that I've seen, but maybe once or twice. Um, are they really that big of a difference? And I think by now it's almost a different movie than we saw, or than than what was put out there. I mean, the story is kind of the same, of course. But visually, it's a different movie. Yeah, and, and for the worse, right? Uh, even watching it this time, seeing the additions on there, they don't look good. They didn't age well. Um, the the digital effects didn't age well that he added. Um, and, you know, we won't even go to the, you know, who shot first. You know, obviously Han did. Um, but I don't know. I, I just, all all I know is give me the original and I'm a happy camper. That's it. That's what I'd rather show my kids. Yeah, I remember. So I, I'm with you all with the fact that, and, and I feel kind of bad for Andrew having only seen the theatrical version a couple of times because I that's what I grew up on was the, the theatrical yeah, version. That's too. the tapes that we had. And the... And what makes it worse is the theatrical cuts that I did see were probably on TNT or... Yeah. TBS with commercials. With commercials, yeah. No, I get that. Yeah. Um, and so when so re, and so Sam, to your point about some of the CGI looking bad, is that these were re-released in the early two thousands, ninety nine two thousand, as part of a uh, get the excitement campaign going for episode one. And mm-hmm. so I guess that would have been ninety seven, ninety eight, ninety nine, ninety nine, and the the CGI. The really there's only okay so there's there's three I'm trying to think there's like three main cases where they added CGI to stuff mostly in Tatooine at most Eisley they added a bunch of animals yeah and it was it was uh, he just wanted a movement. few establishing shots right of, yeah, the, of right. the city itself yeah yeah we just got these big wide shots where we've got these animals walking around and stuff and stuff's walking in front of the camera. And he just wanted, he wants more movement. And I get that. He just, he couldn't afford it at the time. I understand that change, though I, I don't really care for it, but it doesn't, it honestly doesn't bother me. Doesn't change the story. It doesn't change the story. It's just. Or character development. Yeah, yeah that yeah, doesn't yeah. change anything. The other thing that, uh, and then he adds in, in the space battle at the end, the main space battle, he adds in some CGI, which I actually like because it fills in a little bit of some of the um, of the action plot holes, yeah. For me, so like when Luke has got the tie on his on his six, right, and he's like blasted Biggs, where are you? And then in the theatrical cut, you just see an X wing shooting, and then the tie fighter just explodes. But in this version, you get to see the fact that the X wing comes at the tie fighter, and he and Luke almost crash to to shoot the tie. So it's kind of a neat stunt had it been a real, you know, stunt to do. So there's a couple of things like that, that, um, that they added that I'm actually really okay with. And I know that I've been, as I'm talking here, I just realized that none of us have done our five word review, but we'll get there. (laughs) Um, the stuff that that really bothered me. And again, I'm an audio guy, right? You know, for those who've listened to this episode for more than, you know, a few episodes, audio is what I do. I, that's what I, um, you know, I was a sound guy on a film on several movies and TV shows. I, I have more memory with things audibly than visually, or tactile, or taste, or smell, things like that. Right? I can hear a song, and be transported back to 1994, when I was a you know middle schooler, or or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like that's what it is yeah. for me. So when I'm watching this movie, and I've only seen this Disney Plus version one time and I'm watching it and all of a sudden there's things that are changed and it's so jarring to me because my uh-huh. brain is, I'm so used to hearing just simple things. Some like 
the prison escape scene when Chewie bursts out of his 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 uh, handcuffs and they all start shooting the guards and Chewie is holding and the three of us have played Battlefield or Battle uh, yeah Battlefield uh, Five. He's holding an MG42. That's what that gun is. Is it's just an MG42 without the belt, you know. And so he's yeah. So when it shows them shooting the blasters, that's all the same. But when it shows Chewie shooting, they change the sound effect of his gun to the sound that they use for the ATST in the, the Return of the Jedi. And so as soon as I hear that, I thought, is there an like? I immediately my brain thought there must be an ATST in the in the room. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what that sound is for. And there's a there's a couple other moments that I'm going to I have a couple examples that I captured. But I I I don't understand the purpose of it. So, anyway, that's that's kind of my bitch session yeah. on it. I I still love the movie and unfortunately, I kind of think unfortunately, this will be the only version my son knows. Yeah. Yeah. And and of course he doesn't like this one nearly as much as he likes the prequels because the prequels Ugh. are pretty and shiny and Jar Jar is funny. And there's there's more action and stuff. And he my son, he's nine. He likes that stuff. Well, and, and the lightsaber battles. I mean, for goodness sake, yeah. the I mean it's hard to go back to this one after watching everything else. Yeah. For but, sure. But but I do want to try to talk about this movie in a vacuum as much as I can. Um, yeah. Which will be hard, I know, because, again, we've seen so many of the other movies so many times. Uh, so, Sam, I'm going to segue this yep. into your five-word review. All right. Um, I have a two here, um, and they're a close. To, uh, well, there's there's a four and a six. So let me do the um, six one first. Uh, taught us what sci-fi should be. Okay. And okay. then my other one is a perfect cinematic experience. This movie, you know, again, we're going to be, you know, as a fanboy, this movie has everything. It's everything I want to see. Some, you know, when when you first see it, it's it's so much stuff you've never seen before, right? And this is all before, you know, uh, John Carter of Mars or Dune or saw a lot of the things that it stole the ideas from. And um, I like the the pacing of this movie i think is absolutely perfect mm -hmm. uh it brings you to so many weird and unusual places and and introduces you to so many weird and unusual creatures and and characters i just i find that fascinating and it feels lived in and that's one thing we always talk about these types of movies where it feels like a real place it feels like you know tatooine is a real place and most Eisley is a real place with real people that live there and it also doesn't the, – the movie doesn't preach to you, right? It already knows in terms of uh, what it's trying to say, and it doesn't treat you like an idiot. Um, it doesn't overly uh, exposition things to you. Certainly there is some of that with the, the Obi-Wan um, explaining the Force and things like that. But uh, I just – I enjoy this movie for what it is. Now, now that I've said all the good things, the headliner, Luke Skywalker in this movie, is hard to appreciate. Um, the kid <laughs> is whiny. And and I don't know if that's a directorial choice uh, or, or what, but I always have, and I've always had, a hard time getting behind him. <laughs> <laughs> and especially when I watched it again here, I just, I couldn't stand the scenes where that, that he was in. In fact, I'm willing to bet that if Han Solo wasn't in this movie, it would not be as successful as it is. I think his character and his, his story arc, uh, ultimately saves this whole thing. And, um, I, I'm willing to, I think I'm willing to die on that that sword uh saying that okay uh, yeah i don't i don't i mean i mean and it's also how you know we're, we're finding ourselves up against a wall here because what can we say that hasn't been said about star wars before yeah right you know so this is again it's it's incredibly difficult to 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 come up with a of something to say 
But uh, you know, I'm I'm I will say I, I think Luke Skywalker, especially in this movie, is just intolerable. <laughs> yeah, and and I've always thought the same thing, and I I've never blamed Mark Hamill for it. I've always blamed George Lucas, as I yeah. have for most of the bad things that I don't like about Star Wars. Yeah, and you know, I'm sure there's people out there that would argue that fact, but I really do feel like George Lucas you know, the story, this is all him, you know, this, this is his, uh, brainchild, but I really wish somebody else had directed it, you know, and not, yeah. and, and not well, given him so much. Well, creative. this, this is also, um, a, a perfect storm, especially with, um, uh, with the next one with the empire strikes back where people could tell him no. Yeah, people could say, well, I don't know if that's a good idea where he was able to use his creativity, but not in such a way that would ruin uh, storytelling. Right. Well, I, I'll just add. Because specifically for this movie, yeah, he was the writer, director, creator, executive producer. You know, this was one of those movies where it was a labor of love for him. This was the guy that had yeah. a vision, a singular vision. He was going to do the best that he could with what he had. Um, he was able to, you know, I mean, he let's, let's be honest with some other things. He was incredibly lucky that Industrial Light and Magic was, this, was available and as inexpensive as, you know, he could afford them. Mm -hmm. right? Like, because, yep. they, because Star Wars turned them into what they are. Yeah. And though John Williams had done things before, he knocked it out of the park. I mean, how lucky is he to get what would become eventually, arguably, the greatest composer, American composer. I always like to put guys like Aaron Copeland and Leonard Bernstein. And, you know, but, you know, top three American composers of all time. And yeah. He was incredible. Well, this lucky. whole movie is, is lightning in a bottle. It absolutely. Right? It absolutely. It, it's It's... Every, it's it's the sum of the whole is just incredible. The music, the the cinematography, the set design, the the uh, um, even the story. You know, George Lucas and he admits he steals a lot from John Carter of Mars and Dune and and uh -huh. and just What's just the, the um, same old seven you know chosen one story, There's right? A, yeah, yeah. It's like seven seven samurai or Yo Jimbo or something. There's a yeah. There's a yeah. there's an old samurai story that this kind of takes from, and again, that's fine. People borrow from each other all the time, and yeah. and that's fine. I um, but I I'm I'm with you. Well, yeah, Mark. Yeah, Luke's character is a whiny little kind of petulant kid, and that's uh, and that's unfortunate. But it is what it is. What he does, you know, do is he he's supposed to act as kind of the conscience of the show of the of the audience, right? We yeah. we can relate to him more than Han or Leia because he's a he's a poor kid that who is in a bad situation and as you as you find out has a skill set a particular set of skills. You know, <laughs> he's a good pilot and he's a good fighter and he has a you know a connection to the Force. As yeah. we learn, and you know Han is this kind of, you know, he's a space pirate, and Leia yep. is a princess. You know, so we can't really relate to either one of those characters. And of course, Chewie, you don't understand what he's saying. He, Imagine, uh, you know, before Star Wars, before the idea of Star Wars and the success of Star Wars, I could imagine George Lucas trying to sell this story. How hard that must have been. To to yeah. you know sell what this thing would be because be before you see it you know and no one in their right mind would want to finance something like this yeah. it just right. doesn't it doesn't sound good on paper it sounds kooky and, and dumb and we've seen those seventies movies right well, where, saw, where it is that way we saw Star Crash Star Crash yeah. is terrible yeah well that was afterwards though wasn't it it's one year later yeah but. So I mean, and even t to your point, very specifically, the name Star Wars is kind of dumb. Yeah, just the you yeah. know things like the name of Star Wars is kind of dumb. It only works because it works. <laughs> well, that wasn't the original title, was it? 
Uh, yeah, it was always Star Wars. Some of the, I thought uh, I heard. I thought I heard somewhere that there was a different title, and that maybe I'm maybe I'm imagining. Well, I'll maybe you're right. Trivia. I don't know. There's so right. much trivia. This is a movie that I can't. Yeah. I couldn't take the three and a half hours it would have taken to read all the trivia because this movie yeah. has so much yeah. of it. I mean, anytime George Lucas or Dave Filoni or uh, anybody, uh, Kathleen Kennedy, J.J. Uh, Abrams goes on a podcast and says something that's considered trivia, you know, and you have to add oh, it Lord. to it. So, I mean, IMDb's trivia is 500 articles long. So I just, I would just skim and then read one or two and then skim and then read one or two. <laughs> but, I mean, maybe you're right, Andrew. I don't remember that. The one thing, the only part that I remember about the name Star Wars was that originally it was just called Star Wars. And then once he realized that this movie was going to be successful both financially and you know publicly like people liked it and the plans were to then start making a second movie he went back and added in the subtitle a new hope um because originally it was just star wars yeah and that was when he started going back and changing things no, no, <laughs> no not yet that was the beginning <laughs> Well, I guess technically you're right. That is the beginning of him going back and changing things. I guess you're right. Yeah. Yep. There uh, you go. That's funny. Oh, I, okay. So here's the uh, trivia that I've. It was originally titled "The Adventures of Luke Starkiller." Oh, that's right. Oop. Okay. Yeah. When was um, Crash Bandicoot? Not Crash Bandicoot. Um, oh crap! The 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 weird movie we watched. Um, the guy with the watermelon. Um, Gallagher. Oh, what's that? <laughs> I said you said the guy with the water bottle made me think of Gallagher. No, it wasn't Gallagher. <laughs> you know, it, it was a '70s sci-fi. Um, like he's a doctor and a and a surgeon and a, a scientist. Bonsai. Yeah. What was Buckaroo Bonsai? What year was that made? Eighty four, eighty five, eighty. After this. Yeah, okay. Wow. I don't remember the watermelon part, but okay. Yeah, there, I thought there was something. There's something there. Anyway. I don't remember enough of that movie other than I know that it was not as fun as I wanted it to be. <laughs> <laughs> but it was still pretty funny. I mean, all those aliens uh, you're were, right. were pretty great. <laughs> Andrew, do you have a five-word review? Well, actually, I have two four-word reviews and a six-word review. So nice. Okay. Buckle up. Here we go. Yeah. Buckle up, buttercup. First one, where it all began. Nice. There okay. you go. Second one, ahead of its time. Yeah. 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 And then the last one, a whole new world of sounds. Oh, neat. Yeah. Yeah. Because before this movie, a lot of the sound effects that we hear didn't exist. You know, these audio engineers had to create things that had never been filmed before. Yeah. You know, we never had laser guns shooting on screen well and we well, did flash gordon was before this i mean they had right. that but but those sounded terrible they wanted to have something yeah. different and unique yeah so there's a lot of and watching it this time like you sean uh, you know a lot of the sound design stuck out to me especially in this disney plus version but i did think about uh, you know, all those sound effects that that we didn't have, like, you know, a lightsaber sound effect. You know, how do you how do you make a sound? Uh, how do you make a laser sword have a sound? Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, it's just a lot of brilliant thing. And now when you hear that, even if it's not associated with Star Wars, if you hear that sound, you know exactly what it is. <laughs> well, uh, when you hear when you hear the explosion in. Uh, <laughs> What was it? Army of the Dead? Army of Dead, yeah. Yeah. You know that that's from Star Wars. Yeah. Um, exactly. So, anyway. Uh, I agree with, with you, Sam, on, on a lot of what you were saying. I mean, it's, it's... As far as the pacing of the movie, you're exactly right. It does keep your attention. And nothing... I don't feel like it lingers on anything too long. Mm -mm. Um. And so it is, as far as that's concerned, it keeps your attention. And, you know, that's one of my, uh, one of my rules that if a movie keeps your attention, then all the way through, then it, it, it's at least worth watching. 
And this one gives us that. You hear it described as a, a, a space western. And whereas I don't really see it as a, as a western uh, as much as I see like the Mandalorian as a Western. Um, I do get certain qualities of that. Um, and I do agree that Luke Skywalker is a whiny little bitch. <laughs> um, but I, again, I don't blame Mark Hamill at all. Yes. Uh, and maybe that was a Hamill choice, but I really doubt it. I think he's a better actor than that. I hope he is. Well, we, so. we, he gets, I mean, he obviously, we think he gets better in, you know, the later movies. So, yeah, he gets better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's still pretty bad at Empire, though. Yeah. I mean, he with the Yoda scenes, he's. Uh, but he's supposed he, to kind of be fine. like this petulant kid in that, in those scenes, right? He's supposed to be the, the firecracker hardhead. He's supposed to be like. I mean, I guess honestly, when you when you think about the way Hayden Christensen portrayed Anakin Skywalker, you you kind of think maybe he just watched Mark Hamill a bunch and thought <laughs> maybe I should <laughs> act like him because he would get that from me. You know, I don't know. Maybe there's there's something there. Yeah, yeah. All right, so I have two five word reviews. So okay. technically, I only have one five-word review, and I have one three-word review. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not often we uh, we break the rule on the the minus side. Usually, Andrew is like, "I have a five-word review, but it's nine words." Uh, so my first one is great world building. Just uh-huh. simply great world building. But my other one would be best start of a franchise. Yeah. And yep. there aren't many movies. I mean, a lot of movies where you say the franchise, the first episode, the first movie is the best of the franchise, but there, there are not going to be a lot of movies that spark a franchise that this did. This thing broke the world uh-huh. and it broke all kinds of records. I didn't know this. I was reading it in the trivia. This is the first ever $300 million movie. I didn't know that. Wow. In 1977, $300 million is insane. I mean, that's a lot of money. I mean, that's... I don't know what the conversion rate is, but... Oh, I just saw it. Hang on. With inflation, the original Star Wars made the equivalent of today $1,453,455,900. One trillion or one billion? No, one... Yeah, one billion. That's what I meant. Okay. <laughs> Let's say, oh, holy cow! It, 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 Sorry, this movie I, uh, could pay for our national here. debt. It was an extra. <laughs> I'm having trouble with commas tonight. Yeah, a billion. I was like, I made a billion dollars. I mean, that's yeah, that's Avengers yeah. level in 2012. I, I blame it on the peach. Yeah. Yeah, I could eat a peach. For well, and, and people, I mean, I, I can. You can obviously see why it was things you haven't seen before. It's fun. Mm-hmm. Right, it, it is. Uh, it's ultimately rewatchable to to see everything in it. You know, uh, the the cantina scene alone. Uh, you can't check out all the different creatures. Um, you know, in the first viewing. So, uh, it's. I think it's. It was made to be rewatched and rewatchable, and and I. I that's why it does so well. One of the other reasons why I think it also kind of does well, is that. Um. Well, the runtime—it's just—it's a two-hour movie. Like, right? Yeah. You know, if this were two hours and twenty minutes, like it would probably feel too long or something. I don't know. I just—it never feels like it's two hours. Yeah. Uh, maybe the theatrical version was a few minutes shorter, and Lucas added some stuff. I don't know. Okay, I want to go back. The the job of the hut scene is an abomination. I freaking hate that scene so right? much. Yeah. I right? Re- I remember when the first time I saw it, it was on a deleted scene bonus on a DVD that I bought. It was the first like collector's edition DVD, whatever. Yeah. And I remember watching it with my dad, and my dad's sitting here thinking, look, watching is going, well, they obviously filmed it with him talking to something. He's, he's saying lines to Jabba. Yeah. So they had something there, but it doesn't 
it wouldn't be like, but obviously the Jabba is CGI, so it can't be. Yeah, and obviously when Job when Han walks over Jabba's tail, which looks a little janky, but whatever. Yeah, it does. But the the two things that I hate about the that moment really hate is he's basically repeating the dialogue that he said to Greedo. Even I get bored sometimes, you know. Like he's he's just he's repeating dialogue, which is why you don't yeah. like the scene. But the second part that I hate is then Boba Fett walks into the shot and looks at the camera uh-huh. to go. Hi guys, I'm Boba Fett. You're gonna see me in the next movie. Do something. Yeah. Just well, and 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 again, it's it's destroying characters, right? You know, we Java is much more imposing when you don't see him in that first movie. Yeah. Uh, nor do you would a quote unquote mobster like Java be out and about like that. Um, you know, tr- going after someone as as small as Han. So. Uh, it just it wasn't it wasn't a good choice in any it, any any meaning of the word. <laughs> it, it's only thing it does is slow down. It slows down the pacing, yeah. And then for, it literally forces you to go, "Oh, look, there's Boba Fett." Yeah. Um. Just I guess the idea is that you're establishing the thought that Boba Fett works for him, so that when Java. you see yeah, yeah Java, thank you. So when you see Boba Fett in the next movie. You go, oh hey, he works for Jabo. Yeah, but I don't, I don't care. We don't need that. It doesn't matter. It's such a dumb scene. I, that's that's probably my least favorite moment of the whole. Honestly, probably of the entire trilogy of this entire trilogy is that singular moment. I hate it so much. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, I didn't take very many notes on this movie. I just, oh, I well. just sat back and just watched it. Um, again, with you know my CSR glasses on, but I, I don't know. I just uh, the first edition of the CGI stormtroopers. It's fine, but it seems dumb to have stormtroopers on big animals. It yeah, it seemed really dumb because big slow animals. They're big slow animals. I understand that they're they're native to Tatooine, but. We establish well. We haven't established in this movie, so I guess that's the point. Because we we learn later that the 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 Republic and the Empire doesn't really work. They don't have any real presence on Tatooine because it's too far away. No one cares about yeah. Tatooine. So all those troopers that are there are there looking for the droids. So it just seems weird that they would go down to the planet and hire the local animal wrangler man to give them a whatever that thing is. You know, it just, it, it would have made more sense to see them in little walkers, like if they were in little personal little bitty walkers or something, or some kind of transport vehicle. Yeah. I don't know, it's just a dumb shot. Um, I also, so I know that the dialogue when Obi-Wan tells Luke about his dad, that his dad was killed by Vader. And we know that that dialogue was written because George Lucas didn't think there was going to be more movies. So it was more of impactful that way. But I don't know. I always kind of wish that that dialogue could have been just a little different to make it more. Really? I, I thought that was pretty, pretty good choice in terms of, you know, he killed, he killed Anakin, right. And became Darth Vader. So, I thought it was a it was a good play on words, actually. Well, I I, I we know that because of later, right? Yeah. I, I guess my point is I, I it would have been kind of maybe too forward thinking for George to have the words a little bit more obscure than they mm. are, because it yeah. almost makes it feel like the movie is pushing it towards a revenge story. You know, yeah. Darth Vader but... killed your dad, therefore eventually you're going to have to get your revenge. And kill Darth Vader. But I, I will always stand by the fact that I really believe George Lucas had no clue what was happening after that first book, after that first story. <laughs> yeah. I think he had ideas, and I think he had good ideas, and some of them were sporadic and random ideas. But I yeah. think he really did not know where the story was going to go. And I think it kind of was written as it went along. Um, and there's a little evidence to that because there's, um, I mean, there's stories of things like, uh, 
uh, Boba Fett was meant to have a bigger role in the future, uh, you know, episode, well, I guess five and six, right? Mm -hmm. And it was meant to be a bigger villain than he actually was. And then the story changed and that didn't happen. So, you know, I think that, and I will always say this, that he really just wrote a lot of it as they went. Well, it could be that. Could that be part of the Star Wars problem? I think it is. You know, you know, right? The the, the original trilogy obviously did did well with Fly by the Seat of Their Pants, right? But obviously, the prequels um, just couldn't tell a coherent story. Um, but especially the uh, seven, eight, nine, right? Just does not seem to coalesce real well. I think. Um, and we might be having uh, Star Wars nerds yelling at their phones right now. Uh, from Probably. what I remember and understood was that <gasps> four, five, and six were was like a he had an overall arcing idea of what he wanted to do, but he didn't know all of the details. Like he knew that it was you know Vader was going to be the primary, and that there was an, like like he knew these other steps were going to be there, mm -hmm. but he also had no idea how successful the movie was. According to a piece of trivia I read on IMDb, take that for what it's worth. He didn't know, like he he just assumed that it was going to be a flop. So the weekend it premiered, he didn't go to the premiere. He was in Hawaii hanging out with Steven Spielberg, and they once they found out that their movie was being financially successful. That's where they came up with the idea for Indiana Jones, like on a yeah. literally like on a vacation <laughs> together, dudes hanging out in Hawaii. So, to your point, I do think that um, George didn't have a, a, an exact idea of what was coming next, but I also think that he he had an idea of what would he would like to do into the future. I just he didn't know if he was going to be able to tell the story the way you know. And I, and I honestly don't remember, don't know this, and I guess I could Google it but while I'm sitting here, but I'm not going to, is I do know that, I mean, obviously it premiered as episode four. So did it premiere in the theaters in 1977 as episode four, or was that added in? That was added in. Once they, they did the subtitle it, it, of, of A New Hope yeah. to do, hmm. you know what I'm saying? Because once, I mean, like, yeah. when it, like with the original scroll, it just said Star Wars. Right. And then, then the then the read because if it didn't, if it it didn't do that, then that's fine. But once he realized he was going to do a, a a next movie, then he realized, hmm, I need to have this big story to tell, and I'm going to put this this part is the middle of the story, which I still wish he wouldn't have done. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, the last bit of uh. Mm. Well, the only <laughs> other note that I wrote that was kind of a show it's, notes. it's always been a yeah, show notes. <laughs> it's <laughs> always been a little bit of a I, would, I don't know if you would call it a plot hole, but I guess it kind of is. Is during the trench run at the end um when Wedge gets hit but he doesn't die and he says, you know, Luke says, you know, get out of here. There's no you can't do anything else back there. He could still loop around and then get behind the tie fighters. I mean, he's yeah. he's not in immobilized he's just weakened from you know getting hit i always thought like why can't you just loop back and <laughs> anyway, that's uh that and when you know when han and uh when they're they're sneaking on the death star and they turn the corner and there's all the stormtroopers and han shoots one and he starts screaming and then they all run away and then you have that mm -hmm. gag when he turns the corner and there's like 50 of them and then they run yeah. back and Chewie's just like, what's happening? We don't get a resolution to that. He just he just runs down the hallway and then the next thing we have is with Luke and Leia swinging across the thing and then they just rejoin. I always wondered, what did what did Han and Chewie do? Right. <laughs> How did they get out of that pickle? That's, that's one of those things. I, I just found an interesting bit of trivia Yeah. Um, that says, it is impossible to obtain an original theatrical version of Star Wars. Every obtainable release has been altered in some way. Even some of the later theatrical releases in 1977 had changes made to them. That's crazy. Wow. Yeah. Huh. So literally the only, 
Huh, that's interesting. Well, so I told you last week, and I kind of uh, sneakily told you that I have access to theatrical cut versions on Blu-ray. Right. And mm-hmm. so there's a there's a group of people out there that have they're kind of like this collective, and they've been going, they've been like these are guys that literally dumpster dived, dumpster dove, dumpster dived, for dove, dumpster dove, dumpster doved. I like doved for you know projector reel films at behind the movie theaters and stuff and have been over the years you know have kept these these films and have eventually digitized them and so so that's what I have access to now it's grainy as hell i mean it, yeah. it looks like i'm watching a i'm watching on my 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 tv a film projected image but it's <laughs> it's the original and I, I put it on to let Declan kind of see just the opening sequence, how different it looks, like from what, from what's on Disney Plus versus what I would have witnessed. And he says, that's a big difference, Dad. I said, yeah, it <laughs> is. It is a difference. <laughs> uh, my last note was the throne room ending is beautiful and the music is amazing. And I always wondered why Chewie didn't get a medal. Yep. Racism. And, yeah. <laughs> it probably was as simple as that they didn't know if Peter Mayhew could bend down far enough for Leia to put it on him. You know, like it was probably something as simple as that. But um, sure, yeah. yeah, you say that, I say racism. Sure, yeah. Well, yeah. here's another thing that's also really great uh, about this movie is because it has the ability to be retconned so much. So, like in the in the little scene where all the Imperial generals, whatever, are sitting around the board table. And when uh, Admiral Tarkin or Governor Tarkin comes in and he sits down, there's an empty seat next to him. Now, in reality, it's probably because the person that was sitting there was blocking the camera from when they were yeah. having the other two guys were complaining about ancient mysticism and stuff. And it was probably blocking the view of the actor. So they just said, you need to just leave. But what we've retconned is that that would have been the spot for um, uh, Krennic, who was the uh, director Krennic, who was supposed to be the facilitator of the Death Star, but he died in Rogue One. That's why his chair is empty. <laughs> it's yeah. they, haven't, they haven't filled that job yet. They haven't posted it on the LinkedIn. So <laughs> I, I like stuff like that. Again, it's, it, it, it's a total accident. All right? or, you know what I'm saying? But it, it works for the yeah. narrative. Uh, for nerds. Okay, you ready for a few clips? Sure. Yeah. All right. I didn't get a lot, and I'm sitting here as I'm as I'm trying to think about things I would want to capture. Again, what could we capture that hasn't been heard a thousand times? So, <laughs> uh, I've already forgotten what this clip is. It just says clip number one. I didn't label it. So here we go. Mystery clip. Take these two over to the garage, will you? I want them cleaned up for dinner. But I was going into Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. You can waste time with your friends when your chores are done. Now, come on, get to it. There it is, the wine. Uh, uh. Yeah. Okay. I captured this because this bothered me to no end. So this is one of the first audible noise noise or changes that that they did for whatever reason they changed the noise of when obi-wan scares off the sand people Mm, yes i know what you're talking about so i'm gonna play the clip it's two clips back to back the first clip is the original the second clip is what we watched recently Why change it to whatever that other thing was? I get, I don't. I, to me, I've always thought that both of those sounded incredibly fake. You know, it's not a human sound that someone would make. Even a Jedi with, you know, his Jedi powers <laughs> would not be able to make a sound like that. I agree. Um, I. 
I don't know what the purpose of the sound is. Is it supposed to sound like the crate dragon, or is it you know, like what is it supposed to sound like? It doesn't sound like a crate dragon. It doesn't. <laughs> sound, it, it, they're it just they're both bad. they're both dumb. But yeah, if you're gonna change it, then to change it to something less less dumb than what the original was. So I just always thought that was weird. Uh, this one is also labeled noises. I forgot what this one is, but here we go. Here's noises. Oh, right, right, yeah, okay. So this is after Obi-Wan has cut off the dude's arm in the bar, uh, in Mos Eisley, and they added moaning and groaning on the ground, and I think that they did this is because, as a kid, I always thought he killed him. Yeah. He cut off his arm, and therefore he is dead. But I think they added the <laughs> noises because they don't want you to think that Obi-Wan killed a guy just oh because he pushed Luke. So here's the noises that they added. It goes on for a little bit there. <laughs> but I, I think that's why they did that. I really do. And uh, yeah. Uh, okay. I, I had to I had to capture this because oh my gosh. Yes, I bet you have. My donkey. Yep. No one knows what it means. It has no meaning. No one knows what it means. Just I bet you have. Makanki. Makanki. We don't know what it means. It, it just, we don't, I don't know. Uh, um, this is a line of dialogue that doesn't age well because of the prequel movies. So here you go. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I suggest we use it. Don't be too proud of this technological terror you've constructed. The ability to destroy a planet is insignificant next to the power of the Force. Don't try to frighten us with your sorcerer's ways, Lord Vader. Your sad devotion to that ancient religion has not helped you conjure up the stolen data tapes, or given you clairvoyance enough to find the rebels' hidden fort. Probably not yeah. very smart to insult a man's religion that can choke you with his hand. Choke you from across the room, yeah. But it's an ancient religion, right? So, technically it is, right? Technically, the Jedi and the Sith religion is, a, is an ancient religion. But the uh -huh. way that it was delivered and the way I received it as a kid made me think that he is the only one of a thing that has not happened for a long time. Yeah. Again, what I always yeah. thought was that the Empire had been around for a long time. And then the problem with the prequels is, is that we find out that, that the Empire has only been around for 18 years, because that's how old Luke is. <laughs> so it, 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 kind of, it, it kind of makes the Empire seem less um, unbeatable. Imposing. Yeah, it's only been around 18 years. It's not that big a deal. I mean, I know that the Republic that it came from has been around for forever. But, I don't know. I just, that line is always kind of set weird post the prequels. Because it's like, like people are acting like they don't, like, like Han's acting like he's never heard of the Jedi. He's never right. heard of the, you know, like, you were still alive when the Republic was, was a thing. You would have been a kid on Corellia, but you would have still heard the stories of Jedi. Again, that's no problem with that. Uh, here's another piece. This is the only other piece uh, I, I, I captured because it's, again, additional dialogue added in because <laughs> I guess they felt like we needed to have it. But and it's Anthony Daniels talking. It's just Anthony Daniels talking 25 years later. He's going to sound different. Here we go. He says he's found the main controls to the power beam that's holding the ship here. He'll try to make the precise location appear on the monitor. The tractor beam is coupled to the main reactor in seven locations. A power loss at one of the terminals will allow the ship to leave. So that last sentence was added. Because we, the audience, are too stupid to understand that Obi-Wan has to go turn off the power to the, to right. the tractor beam. You don't need the line. 
It's fine. No, you don't. We're going to put it on the map, and then before, it was just them looking at the map, and then Obi-Wan knows what to do, and then we go watch him stand on that very perilously dangerous bit of architecture yes. to turn down the thing. And even as a kid, I always thought, why would they make that so dangerous? And then I thought, well, I guess if you're going to have a system that's so important like the tractor beam, you would want to <laughs> make it difficult to get to. <laughs> um, but but I will say this, in George Lucas's version, in this movie specifically, the architecture is always pretty similar. Railings are not a thing. You people walk across shit. OSHA is time. not a thing in this universe. Yeah, not, not at all. Um you know, like the two guys that are that are firing the laser cannon that are a couple feet away. Like, there's no railing there. I mean, they even make fun of it in Family Guy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> what did, did you say something? I said, all we want is a railing so we don't fall off. Well, why did he say no? He said we would lean on it, you know. <laughs> 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 all right. Time for uh, this. And now for some more bad news. Ready? Again, this movie is a movie that just has so much trivia, so I, I didn't yeah. want to do too much of it. So here's and you, this, and people probably heard it all before. They too. probably have. I tried to find a couple pieces of trivia that I had not heard before, so I wanted to just read them. In the early drafts of the script, R2-D2 could speak standard English, and he had a rather foul vocabulary. Although all of R2's English speech was removed, many of C-3PO's reactions reactions to it were left in which made me think that and uh, not anthony daniels that um kenny baker is is saying lines yeah right and they're reacting to them and that's just which is kind of funny uh the actors found george lucas to be very uncommunicative uncommunicative that sounds right towards them communicative communicative that sounds more more right more better with his only directions generally being either faster or more intense. At one point, when he temporarily lost his voice, the crew pivoted, provided him, excuse me, with a board with just those two phrases written on it. <laughs> <laughs> Contrary to popular belief, this is a piece of trivia that I don't really think is, is true. I think this is, um, hold on, where's my, uh, I need a good, I need a good one. Hold on. Uh, that is one big pile of shit. Okay, I think someone put this in on behalf of George Lucas so people would stop yelling at George Lucas. But contrary to the popular belief, Greedo shooting first in the remastered version of the movie was not George Lucas's fault. The MPAA insisted he put it in there in order for the movie to keep its PG rating. No, no, I don't, I don't believe I don't that. Believe either. that for a second. Oh. So, That's just unless someone yeah. that works for the MPAA can tell me otherwise, I call. Right. <laughs> totally, d- yeah, I don't believe it at all. I I call shit for that. <laughs> that was Captain America saying shit. Uh, time for. Oh wait, hang on. Yeah, I found another piece of trivia that I find relevant to our conversation. Okay. Okay. It says the Library of Congress has the unadulterated 35 millimeter print of Star Wars submitted to them in 1977 for copyright and anyone can watch it by prior appointment. The the un what? Unadulterated. Unadulterated. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Un, un untampered with. The original cut. Yeah, I was I would have expected I was expecting you to say the word unaltered, but when you said unadulterated it made me think like 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 sexy stuff like adultery, <laughs> like there's like there's well, a porn version. Some people, your mind, son. Some people find Star Wars sexy. I I don't well, know. You know, Leia with no bra because there's no bras in space. No, the gravity is less, so it doesn't. Well, that's know. literally what she has said. She's on record saying that like when she was putting her clothes on, George Lucas wouldn't. She wouldn't. She wasn't allowed to wear a bra. They wanted her to be free because according to him, there's no bras in in the future or something. That's something that Carrie Fisher has been on his own record. Saying. Yeah. yeah. Uh, time for this. Why aren't you playing? Excuse me while I whip this out. Top three. So speaking of trivia, we decided to do top three fun trivia. Things that you like 
just the stories that you like, things that you find interesting about Star Wars, anything at all. This is an opportunity for the three of us just to share something, whether it's honestly, if you don't have three, that's fine. I don't really care. Um, uh, just, <laughs> just share something, just, you know, a, a fun moment with you in Star Wars. Um, I might have gone in a, in a different direction than what Andrew intentioned, but uh, no, it's fine. Yeah. Sam, uh, if you wouldn't mind, go first. Yeah, sure. Um, I've got uh, obviously three here. Um, the first one is, and I didn't realize this until looking it up. Um, oh, well, this the well, this is Star Wars trivia, all Star Wars, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, any of it. Yeah. The final, the final victory song sung by the Ewoks mm -hmm. um, was written by the same guy who wrote Africa for Toto. Nice. <laughs> So, uh, cool. you know, they blessed the rains down in Endor, uh, as well. It's so amazing. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, also learned that the, apparently the trash scene, the trash compactor scene, um, the, was in fact, they used real trash mm -hmm. and the smell was so bad <laughs> that Mark Hamill even burst a blood vessel from trying to hold his breath. Yeah, it's great. So I thought that one was good. Not to mention that uh, Peter Mayhew's uh, yak hair Chewbacca suit was uh, was soaked in it. <laughs> it apparently reeked for the rest of the production. So yeah. I thought that was awesome. And then last but not least, apparently um, Harrison Ford has quite the temper. And uh, he got so upset at one point that he actually took a saw to, his, to the Millennium Falcon um, because he was getting so mad. And uh, at one point, people had to go up to uh, actually. It was said Hamill went up to Lucas to say, "Hey, you've got to stop Harrison. He's sewing. Up, he's sawing up the Falcon." He wow. said, "Get off my plane." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's so, crazy. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was were re re pretty cool stuff that I didn't know. Wow, that's great. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, um, I'll do mine. And then we'll let uh, Andrew and then trivia or then the Twitter. This is trivia. Uh, <laughs> one of them is I love the fact that there is a direct connection between Avatar, the last airbender and the rebels cartoon TV show. Uh, Delay Fil Dave Filoni was a producer on both. He directed a lot of the episodes of rebels, executive produced it as well as produced, um, not Rebels. I, mean, I said that wrong. He re he did produce uh, um, Rebels, but he also um, and and Airbender. But he was also uh, a writer on Mandalorian. So like the uh -huh. the the pauldrons, like his uh, the the his hand guards on yeah. Mando are arrows as a direct reference to Avatar: The Last Airbender. It's a reference to that and not to that. I think that's really cool. Um. Another one that everyone has either heard, Star, true Star Wars fans has heard, but I remember hearing it from my dad when I was a kid and just being really kind of was neat by Nostalgic. it. Nostalgic. Yeah, is that what R2-D2 stands for. And it was just, it's simply real to, R-E-E-L, to dialogue to. The, the, the dialogue is on the second channel strip on film. Uh. And... And so when they were talking about, it was literally just like the sound guys were talking about some stuff and George Lucas just overheard them and it was like, oh, that could be a thing because they didn't know what to call them and how they were going to call them. There's, there's another clever thing for C-3PO, but I don't remember it, but I remember real to dialogue to. And then the number one for me that I've always loved is uh, I watched a documentary 30 years ago on some of the, how they made the sounds of Star Wars, like how they made the lightsabers and stuff. But my favorite mm -hmm. is how they made the blaster sounds. And it is so simply and, and ingenious is, you know, those like high tension power lines, like, you know, you see mm -hmm. like a power pole and then those high tension wires that go to the ground. It's just that steel, right? The guy just put a microphone on it and then struck it with a ball peen hammer. And that's that, oh. that blaster sound is just him striking it. And and you know adjusting the microphone in different spots. I just I love that. Um, so there you go, Andrew. All right. Um, so Harrison Ford is and always will be Han Solo in many of our eyes. But did you know that before Harrison Ford got the role, two 
of our favorite actors were considered. Number one, Burt Reynolds. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they he probably was, couldn't afford him, honestly. He was, yeah, probably. He was coming off the heat, though, of Smokey and the Bandit, right? So he was a yeah. very popular actor there. Uh, and then the other one, uh, there were many, but uh, one of the other ones that's one of our favorite, Christopher Walken. Oh, my God. Was also considered for Harrison Ford. <laughs> I oh, that would have been all. perfect. <laughs> that would have been so weird. <laughs> uh, Chewbacca! So... <laughs> Hand me the c- controls! Yeah, that was perfect. Spot on. It, yeah, it was great. Um, so, uh, George Lucas has been, it's on record of him saying that Star Wars is actually being told by R2-D2 some hundred years after Return of the Jedi, which is kind of cool. But I would, if that's the case, at some point I want to see an old rusted bucket (laughs) R2-D2. On a front porch somewhere. On a front porch plugged up to a a USB charger. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> telling the story, you know, and the charger has to be worn. So it's, you know, somebody has to kind of hold it just right. Yeah, Otherwise it's yeah. not charging. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But how does, there's so many scenes. I know that the story is supposed to be the point of view of the droids, but there's so many scenes that they're not at all, like at all. Right. In, you know. Yeah. And then my, uh, my number one is that star Wars comic, the comic book or the, uh, uh, whatever you call them, graphic novels. There was a character written named Jedi Master Bates. No, oh my gosh! <laughs> and it was done as a joke, but it wasn't noticed uh, when it went through the publisher, and it actually made it out to the public. And so there was a Jedi Master Bates uh, there for a while. So that's number one. That's perfect. Uh, I have a bonus, if you'll allow it. Okay. I I just saw this a few minutes ago. Yoda actually has a full name. And his name wasn't always Yoda. Before Yoda, his name was going to be Buffy. Oh, I saw that one, too. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. And 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 after they... Yeah. And after they scrapped it, they actually changed his name to Minch Yoda. And then Minch was dropped, and it was just Yoda. So there's, that's my bonus one. There you go. Uh, Minch. Uh, we've got a couple here, entries on Twitter. Jesse from Sudden Butt uh, says, he just wrote three here. They're pretty basic. Um, unfortunately, I don't really know all of the context. So I guess we'll have to do some searching on our own. One is based on Dune. Two, saved in the edit. Not really sure. I guess I'm not really sure what that means, but I guess there's something there. And lastly, T the the THX one one three eight thing. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. That's that's oh. it. That's oh, that's okay. the trivia. I know oh, I th- th- there was more coming. I'm sorry. No, that's it. His the THX I know would become his. Uh, it was the name of a movie that he did, I think, and George Lucas mm-hmm. like one of his first movies, and it would also become the name of his. Uh, like audio encoding process, like like Dolby Digital, um, and then the one one three eight is a is a reference to cell block one one three eight, where Leia is. So there's a connection there. So that's there. You go. Uh, also, from our good friend Eric uh, from Cinematic Sound Radio podcast. The first track of Star Wars music ever recorded took place on March fifth. 1977. The cue was called Chasm Crossfire. This was also the um, London Symphony Orchestra principal trumpet Maurice Murphy's first day ever recording with the London Symphony Orchestra, and he would perform with them until 2007. Wow. Hmm. Oh, that's neat. Thank you, uh, Eric, for that. That's great. Uh, it must have been a lot cheaper to film over in... in- England at that time. Well, right? it was partly and Tunisia. Because, well, yeah, I mean they were they, they yeah, they yeah, Tunisia was where they did all Tatooine and stuff, but they filmed a lot of the uh the studio work was in London. I think it was simply because Hollywood studios wouldn't take them. 
Mm-hmm. I know that was one of the issues with the the Batman movie that we did, the eighty nine Batman, is that no Hollywood studio would want to do it. That's why they had to. They also filmed a lot of it in London. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, time for this. Wait, what's supposed to happen? That's right. We're gonna give this movie a score. Oh, soundtrack grade. I would give it a P for perfect. It's the perfect soundtrack. Perfect. I mean, yep. It's, yeah. I agree. In, in my opinion, with the exception of the uh, cantina performance that was added later by the CGI singer. Oh, <laughs> so I thought that Forgot was about in, that. that's in yeah. Jedi. That's not in this, is it? Oh, wait a minute. You're right. You're right. That's that's in I'm Jedi. I'm sorry. I'm getting my movies crossed. Yeah, that's in uh, Return yeah, of the Jedi, right. which is it is that is terrible. It's an abomination. It really is bad. Uh, okay. Um, Andrew, out of 10 Out of 10 I, I don't like this one the most And I do feel like um, There are some issues But overall It's a good film And I think that it's a groundbreaking film And a um, Certainly If I were to Or if we were to be able to see A thousand years into the future And people were to say Hey, what is a milestone In cinema this would still be at the top i think um so i'm gonna put this at a an 8.6 that's exactly what imdb has it as oh good to know i i didn't ask the question and, and i guess i can ask it now or i can ask it at the end when we do the other one but yes um, this was my first time viewing <laughs> <laughs> you said this isn't your favorite of the trilogy um, right if we were to rank them, do we, we want to wait until do that until we do Return of the Jedi? Maybe yeah, we wait. Okay. Yeah. Sam, um, it's I love this movie. You know, it is a staple of my childhood, but it does have some flaws, right? It does have some some whiny uh, uh, heroes in it, um, but it, I can't take too much off. Off, it's just too perfect. It's it, nine point zero eight out of ten. All right. Uh, yeah, I mean, this, uh, yeah, I'm with you. I uh, I love it too. I love this movie. Um, it's also not my favorite of the trilogy, but it's it's a truly great film. I mean, I, I think it really is a, a great film. And even with all the little dumb things that have been added later, you know, yeah, those things won't affect my son. He will still like this movie growing up. You know, yep. it only affects us because we've seen. The other version. If this was the first version we had ever seen, and I'd watched this version 40 times, and then I would be introduced to the other, you know, oh, here's the theatrical version, I'd probably go, okay. I, 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 you know, saying like I would probably say the same things, right? Yeah. Except maybe I would go, that Java scene wasn't really necessary. But I think, you know, as far as some of the other, no additions, it'd be fine. Anyway, I'm also going to give this movie a nine. I'm just going to give it a straight nine. Uh, it's a great film. It's, I mean, it's, it, this would have to be in my top 10 of all time lists. I think. I don't see why not. Yeah. And again, and, and, and I also want to put to bed the notion that you can't like Star Trek and Star Wars. I think that, that notion <laughs> is, is really dumb. And I'm been, I've not seen that fight on Twitter, which I'm really thankful for, because it's so dumb to to argue those two points. And Sam, you mentioned I think in your, your maybe Sam, your three word, or you said like the best science fiction or the the perfect science fiction, or whatever. And um, I I always call this movie science fantasy, because yeah uh, yeah you know yeah. Th- this movie is in more related to uh, Lord of the Rings than it is to Star Trek, but well uh, George. Uh, Decay did, if you remember, try to get the Star Wars and the Star Trek fans together to basically hate on Twilight when it came out. <laughs> so, you know, I think that they can coexist. Common enemy kind of a thing. I like yeah. That. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, awesome. Uh, that's going to do it. That's our show. Uh, I'm going to end with our quote game where I, I, I play, um, 
That's gross. Uh, last week was They Call Me Mr. Tibbs. This week, it's Oh No, It Wasn't the Airplanes, It Was Beauty That Killed the Beast. So that game is simply, if you know that quote, the one I just read, I guess They Call Me Mr. Tibbs. Oh, crap, I should know what that is. Uh, Sidney Poitier said the line. I can't remember the name of the movie. Guys? They Call Me Mr. Tibbs. Any, any one of you know it? Uh, the Rescue is Down Under. No. <laughs> is that the name of the uh, is that the name of the movie? The name of the movie oh, no, is no, called no. They Call Me Mr. Tibbs. Oh. That's the name of the movie with Sidney Poitier. Uh Martin Landau, Barbara McNair, Anthony Zarb. Zarby. Anyway, that's that. This one, however, is not that. Oh no, it wasn't the airplanes, it was beauty that killed the beast. If you know the quote, shoot me an email or a, a message or Facebook, Twitter, whatever. And uh, if you know the quote, what movie that's from, I will send you a sticker. It's simple as that. I'll save you the trouble. It is Beauty and the Beast. That's right. He's absolutely... On a plane. Wonderful. It's the sequel. They fly a plane <laughs> out of the castle. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that's actually right. It might be in the ex- the director's cut version of Beauty and the Beast, where they went back The in Snyder the, version. The yeah. Snyder cut, <laughs> where, yeah. where the beast swears <laughs> a lot, and it's all gray. It's very strange. Yeah. <laughs> well, next week, obviously, we're going to be doing Empire Strikes Back. I'm looking forward to that. We're going to have a guest on next week. Um, we're going to have uh, the Soundtrack Alley podcast on next week, and we're going to talk probably more about the score than we did today, as well as the movie itself. So I'm very excited for that. And then lastly, uh, for Return of the Jedi, we're going to have the Lady Wan coming back on. We haven't seen her <laughs> in a while, and we're very excited for that. And it's all great stuff. In the meantime, go to our website, cheapseatreviews.libsyn.com. Facebook is at che- or Facebook.com slash cheapseatreviews at cheapseatcast is on Twitter. Please follow us there. That's where I do most of my communication now is on Twitter. And uh, it's a lot of fun. Come hang out and uh, check us out. Also, thank you so much to, uh, to our listeners across the pond. We have been growing in Europe. It's actually kind of neat. I've been seeing our numbers. We're, That's we're that getting. British, uh... British Viagra. Yeah. <laughs> we're getting a lot of <laughs> we're we're getting downloads in Germany. Uh we've we've had downloads in England for a little while and France, but now we're getting downloads in Germany and Spain, which is neat. Uh and also we had some some downloads in um Saudi Arabia, which I know is not in Europe, but um I just think well, this super... a lot of people in the south it is, so it's cool. Oh, yeah, 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 you're right. <laughs> <laughs> It's not America. That's all they know. Uh, Commies. <laughs> I think we do have we do have a couple of downloads from Russia, but that was because we did a Russian film. That's gonna do it. That's our show. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for listening. And next week we'll see you for Empire Strikes Back. So on behalf of Sam and Andrew, this is Sean saying thank you very much. Reviews.